Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us this afternoon, James and I, um, for this seminar on education otherwise than at school or uh, college, as, as the case may be. Um, it's being hosted jointly by Landmark Chambers, where I am, um, Rooko in Sweeney, uh, which is where James is at, and Support Send Kids. Um, and we're really grateful for you to, to join us today. Just a brief introduction on, on who uh, those, those bodies are. So Landmark is a barrister's chambers um, with significant expertise in education law, including SEN law. Um, Rooko and Sweeney is a uh, leading uh, firm in various areas of public law, including education with significant expertise in SEND, and they are home to uh, some of the leading education lawyers in the country. Support SEND Kids is a charity which uh, provides SEN advice in a user-friendly question and answer format through their website, and their aim is to bring the SEND community together um, and sharing knowledge. And um, I personally have had some experience working with them um, and it's been very great. Um, we've been moving the Noddy Guide, which some of you may um, well be aware of, into a digitized format as an alternative way to digest the information. Um, and that's uh, and that is all on the Support Send Kids website. So I'm Leon Glenister, I'm a barrister at Landmark, and I'm joined by James today, who is a, a solicitor with Cohen Sweeney. The aim of James and I is to go through the law and procedures and practice in relation to EOTAS, as it's come to be known. We're aiming for the session to be about an hour, so we'll be talking probably about 45 minutes, and then we should have a, a bit of time at the end for some of the uh, for answering some of the questions that you'll be sending in. So on that, I will turn to James to provide a bit of an overview of EOTAS and just as uh, just before he does that, I'll just give a brief introduction. James is um, one of the very few solicitors in the UK who is, who is ranked by the legal directors as a star associate. And I think that justifies me in saying he is one of the leading education solicitors in the UK. And having worked with him for many years, I can personally attest to his knowledge and expertise in this area. So um, I'll, on that, I'll hand over to you, James, to give us a bit of an introduction. Thanks, Leon. So... I'm just going to kind of summarise what we'll be looking at today. And, and thank you for the introduction, Leon, also. So we'll be looking at what EOTAS is, because sometimes a child or young person might be out of school, but they may not be receiving EOTAS provision, and there are different ways in which educational support can be provided. So we'll look at that. We'll look at what the law says, and it's section 61 of the Children and Families Act, which um, kind of sets out the EOTAS test. So Leon will take you through that and we'll take you through the relevant case law. We'll look at the procedure that should be followed if it's felt that EOTAS may be required for a child. So if a parent thinks that or the school or local authority, we'll look at how EOTAS should be dealt with in an EHC plan. We'll look at what evidence might be relevant if EOTAS is something that is being thought about, we'll look at the different ways of resolving disputes, if there's not agreement between everybody as to what's required, and then hopefully we'll aim to have around 50 minutes at the end for uh, questions. So let's go on to look at what EOTAS is. So essentially, it is what it says on the tin. We're talking about education outside of a formal school or college setting. Now, Leon will run you through the legal test later, but essentially, the if I summarise the key points here, um, it's where a local authority in England, so that's important, all of this presentation today is about the law in England as opposed to Wales. It's where local, a local authority in England make special educational provision for a child or young person outside of a formal school, college or early years setting. And they can only do that if it's satisfied that it would be inappropriate for that provision to be made in the formal setting. So that's what Leon will talk you through. Key points about EOTAS is it is local authority funded. So this is where a local authority is, is arranging this provision. It can be full time 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be full time. Some, a person may attend a school but receive some provision outside of school by way of EATAS. And it can be at home, but again, it can be in any kind of external setting. So sometimes maybe in a local library or whatever, in a supported living placement if, if they're, they are um, an adult. So it can be in a range of settings. So that is what EATAS is. We'll now look at what it is not. So there's another way that education can be provided called elective home education. Often in these situations, a child may have an EHC plan, but that plan doesn't contain any reference to EATAS provision. So the local authority position is that that child can attend school, but maybe that isn't agreed to. So maybe the, the parent prefers to educate them at home or deregisters from the school, sometimes because they may think that that setting isn't suitable. Now, in that situation, the Children and Families Act states that a local authority doesn't have to provide the provision in an EHC plan if a parent has made suitable alternative arrangements. So if a parent takes a child out of school and decides to home educate and the local authority aren't on board with that, they will that will often be seen as elective home education. And therefore that isn't local authority funded because the in the local authority's mind, they th that child can attend school so pair by by electively home educating the parent is essentially taking on responsibility for that child's education and if there's a dispute between the parents and local authority about that so maybe the parental view is that school isn't suitable that is something that may need to be resolved through the tribunal and we'll talk about that as we go on um, also sometimes a child may be out of school for a temporary period of time so maybe they have an EHC plan or they don't have an EHC plan, but for whatever reason, and they're registered at a school, but for whatever reason, they can't attend. So maybe they've broken their leg or maybe they've got mental health issues that mean that they're not able to attend at the moment. Section 19 of the Education Act says that in those situations, the, the local authority has to put in place suitable alternative arrangements to ensure that they receive education. Um, what is suitable in some ways is quite broad. A, a local authority has discretion, a large amount of discretion to decide what is suitable. Whereas with an EOTAS package where that's permanent, that will generally be set out in an EHC plan and be very specific as to what is going to be provided. So this is more kind of the, a, a, for temporary arrangements, essentially. Whereas if it's felt that this is going to need to be a permanent arrangement, then we're going to need to look at EATAS provision and having that set out in an EHC plan. And we'll come on to that. So I will pass over to Leon. In terms of Leon, thank you for your lovely introduction, Leon. Leon, as he mentioned, is a barrister at Landmark Chambers. He frequently is instructed to act in education cases and in the SEN tribunal, both the first tier and the upper tier tribunal. He worked on the DM and Cornwall case with me that Leon will speak about later in terms of what that judgment said. And as Leon mentioned, he co-authors the Noddy Guide, which a lot of you may already be aware of, but is a kind of a comprehensive free guide on SEN law and kind of, yeah, is used a lot by practitioners and other people in the SEN community. So I'll pass over to Leon now to take you through the, the case law and legislation. Thank you very much, James. Um, so I'll take you through Section 61, which, as James says, is the main statutory provision, and then look at some of the case law. So introductory summary, key provision, Section 61, that sets out uh, the power for the local authority to make provision uh, otherwise than in school or college. The key case is a case called NN, and that um, is where Judge Rowley in the upper tribunal provides um, a very comprehensive summary of the law in this area and then gives guidance. And if you're looking for a paragraph, go to paragraph 47. All of those cases are available on the Upper Tribunal website if you're, uh, if you're trying to find them online. So the way I'll deal with this segment, I'll try to break it down into 
six what I hope are simple questions some are more simple than others so the first question is what provision is necessary the second is whether that provision uh, whether it is inappropriate to make that provision in a school or college thirdly um, the duty to consult on EOTAS Fourthly, um, whether it's a discretion or a duty for the local authority to provide EOTAS. Fifthly, where does it go in the plan? And then lastly, what then goes in section I? So I'll take those questions in turn, just in terms of the structure. So section 61, as I said, the key provision, and I'll just read it out because it's quite important to use that as our base and the grounding. So a local authority in England may arrange for SEP that it's decided is necessary for a child or young person for whom it's responsible to be made otherwise than in a school or post-16 institution or a place at which relevant early years education is provided. So there is a power to provide education otherwise than at school. Limitations on that, there are two. The first is that the authority may only um, provide that provision outside of school or college if it would be inappropriate for the provision to be made in a school or post-16 institution. And secondly, before making any decision, the authority has to consult with the child's parent or the young person. And so we'll break that down now. Question one, where does it fit into the analysis? So EOTAS provision applies, as it says in 61 subsection one, to the provision that has been decided to be necessary for the child or young person. So it doesn't affect the prior question, which for the lawyers is in section 37 of the 2014 Act, as to what provision is necessary. So you have to decide what provision is necessary, and then the EOTAS question follows that question. Um, and so it might be very tempting to think, I want EOTAS, what is on offer in the local community that uh, could be provided, but that's the wrong, that's putting the cart before the horse. You need to look at the provision and then decide EOTAS and not start with the basis that there will be an EOTAS package. So it's the second question after what provision is necessary. So that's question one, the simpler end of the, the six questions. Two, probably at the harder end, is on what's inappropriate. So how do, how do you apply the test of whether the provision can, is inappropriately will be delivered at school or college? Now, first point is when it says inappropriate to be delivered at a school or college, that means any school or college. So it's not just that it's inappropriate in a single college. So just because the local authority puts forward a placement and say a tribunal will determine that it would be inappropriate for the pr provision to be delivered at that placement, that may be indicative of section 61 being satisfied, but it is not inevitable. So that wouldn't necessarily mean um, it's satisfied because it may be that other schools could provide that within their setting. The outcome of it being any school means the reasons to be relied upon for whether provision would be inappropriately made at a school or college generally don't focus on the, any particular school or college, but will focus on either the child or young person in question, such as anxiety about attending school at all or, or something along those lines, or um, it may be something to do with the provision itself, like specialist equipment needs to be uh, used, which isn't generally available in school. So it'll be something along those lines, generally. It may be that a child is benefiting from a very specific form of therapy, um, which is only delivered in, in certain places in the country, and you have to go into the clinic for it, for example, I've had that in a case, and that might be a basis why that would be inappropriate for that to be made in a school or college. So what you're looking at is whether it's inappropriate to be delivered in any school or college. And although I've pitched it as quite a high test, there is a degree of common sense about it all. So 
it's not, I don't think a tribunal would be entertaining an argument by the local authority saying, well, there's a school on the other end of the country who could possibly provide it because that's a school. That's probably not where we're at. But a good guide might be to say, well, let's look at the schools in the local area. Could it be made in any of those? And that will be indicative of whether the test is satisfied. And that kind of uh, common sense overlay of any school is um, reflected in what inappropriate means. So the, there is case law on this and it's TM Hounslow and it's cited in NN as well. So you're not looking at whether a school simply can make the provision because a school with enough money generally can make most provision. What you're looking at is whether, and I quote, would it be suitable or would it be proper to be made in a school or college? And what factors then need to be taken into account? Well, there is a list in TM and Hounslow, very usefully. It's non-exhaustive, so almost any factor will potentially be relevant. But the list that they give is the child's background and medical history, educational needs of the child, facilities that can be provided by um, a school and otherwise than at a school, the costs of alternative provisions, the child's reaction to provisions, parental wishes and any other particular circumstance that might apply. So there's that big catch all at the end. So it's a broad discretion. Now, parental wishes or the young person's wishes are definitely relevant. Parental wishes, not least by the statutory provision of Section 9 of the Education Act. Um, but as the case law says on that provision and more generally, parental wishes aren't determinative. It's ultimately a judgment for the local authority. But I'll give you some examples in the case law where, where it's been satisfied. So in M and Hertfordshire, um, school related anxiety may lead for it to be inappropriate for the provision to be made in a school. And um, in NN, a child's firm views in the in the wider context of controlling behaviour um, was taken into account as a factor. But overall, um, there is a very wide discretion for the local authority and on appeal a tribunal as to whether this question is satisfied and most factors that might sound like they're relevant probably are relevant to the analysis. The last point to cover sorry on whether provision is inappropriately made at a school or college is when it's part of can part of a provision be inappropriate and the answer is, is, is implicit in what I've said already is um, yes so uh, if, for example, a particular type of therapy, it's very commonly seen, I've seen in multiple cases where physiotherapy, for example, would be inappropriately made in a school because either you need specific equipment or because there's some specialist therapy that needs to take place. All of that might be done out of school, say on a, you know, on a Friday morning or something, and it's accommodated around a wider placement. So it's not an all or nothing game. You can have some of the provision that's made outside of school, so EOTAS. The third question then is whether there has been consultation. So you will recall section 61 requires consultation with the parents or young person if EOTAS is being proposed. Um, that underlines the fact that a relevant factor will be the views of the child, young person and parents. Um, in terms of consultation, there are very fairly well established legal rules as to what consultation needs to be. So um, there are four rules, they're often called the Sedley criteria. So the decision must be made at a formative stage. So, um, so the consultation must be made at a formative stage. So you must be consulted um, when the decision hasn't been finally taken. So you can't, the local bar can't say we want to uh, provide EO test or we don't want to provide EO test and then consult after that. You've got to do it when the decision is being made. Um, there needs to be sufficient sufficient information given. So um, parents or young person need to be able to understand the issues and respond. There needs to be time to respond and then that response has to be taken into account in the decision making. So those are the general sort of fairly common sense principles as to how consultation needs to occur. But as I've said, the discretion is ultimately for the local authority and on appeal the tribunal, and they will have to take account of any views, but they aren't determinative or binding. The next question then is whether um, it's a discretion or a duty to provide EOTAS where the 
uh, criteria of subsection 61.2. So the inappropriate criteria, if that's satisfied, is the local authority under a discretion or a duty? Now, this is a bit of a more legal point, I'll warn you, but it's a short one. Um, section 61.1 says the local authority may arrange for provision to be provided otherwise in a school or institutional placement. So on its face, it looks like a discretionary duty or a power. So the local authority can, but is not obliged to arrange SEP where it would be inappropriate to deliver that in a school or college. But I think there are two important caveats. One is that the local authority is in any event under a duty to secure the provision that's been made in, that's been set out in section F, and that for the law is a section 42 of the Children and Families Act. So given there is an, a, a, a duty to secure the provision, if the local authority thinks it can't deliver that provision in a school because it's inappropriate, it follows logically that it has to be made outside of school. So I'm not really sure the discretion really matters it, to the extent there is any discretion. The other point is that this whole overarching discretion will be very similar to the discretion inherent in determining whether provision is inappropriate or not. So the same sort of factors will arise. So really there is discretion within the process already built in. So I don't think it's much of a point that um, anyone needs to be too worried about. Next question, question five is where does EOTAS go in the EHCP? And this is on one level, a simple question. There's a bit of nuance to it. So simple answer is the provision goes in section f because that's where special education provision goes there's no need to specify i don't arguably it's, it shouldn't go in um the providers of specific provision shouldn't really go in section f so it doesn't need to be put into section f um i've seen it put in and that's fine i think that's what common practice but actually legally i'm not sure it really should be going in but the provision itself will always be in section f the wider question, and this is the DM question, I'll go into this case in a bit more detail just because it was the hook on why um, EOTES sort of came back to uh, people's consciousness recently, um, is DM and Cornwall. So here we had a child who had significant learning difficulties, and uh, perhaps unusually in the context of tribunals, all the parties, local authority um, and appellant, agreed that EOTES should um, be implemented. So there was no proposal from anyone that the child would be going to a school. Now, one of the overarching criticisms that was made on appeal by, by James and I was that the provision was unspecific. And we put that argument in the context of a wider point. Um, and we said, uh, where it is established case law that if a child is going to attend a special school, there to an extent, or that's case specific, there can be greater flexibility on section F and how specific that needs to be because the school implementing it will be familiar with the ways provision implemented. So we said the converse must be true. Now the converse is that if there is no school at all and it's all to be done at home, there needs to be even greater specific specificity in section F um, to ensure that everyone knows what's going on and that provision can be properly implemented. Now, um, the judge, uh, came on that more broad point, uh, reacted in a fairly predictable but potentially helpful manner. He, he accepted the idea in a general sense, is what he said, um, and it may be the case, but uh, as ever, and unsurprisingly, it's always context specific and it will be to depend on the facts of the case. So um, here, there, it was accepted in that context that there was all going to be a test that some of the provision was uh, not sufficiently specific. So there was provision for an all about the child document to be drafted, um, which basically the tribunal said was delegating the local authorities function to others. It's the tribunal that should be that it should be local authority and or tribunal who determines what the needs are. That it's not to, for the local authority to say, well, we'll draft a document later on regarding needs. So there were elements where the court found that um, there was insufficient specificity. Um, but on the broader point, it's useful to put it into context, I guess. So my sort of learnings from that case is um, in specific cases and where there is the OTAS, just be 
mindful of the fact that where there's no oversight from a school, it can be helpful to be more specific in the provision being set out in section F. So then the last question then is what goes into section I? So um, section I is limited to the placement the child attends, and that is the name of the placement and the type of placement. Nothing else can go in. So you can't put bespoke provision. You can't put bespoke provision at X placement. You can't put home because the home is not where the placement the child is attending. So that is fairly settled law. So then that leads to two alternatives. The first is if the child or young person is not attending any placement um, at all, then section I is left blank. And that's a logical next step from the fact that the local authority has determined that provision would be inappropriately made at a school or um, college. So if it's inappropriate, then you can't name an appropriate provision, it wouldn't work. So you just leave it blank. If the child does attend a school for at least some of the time, then it's that placement that goes into section I. Um, and what attends or means is be present at. So even if the child's going in and getting an alternative curriculum, for example, not necessarily in the classes, but is attending a or be is at is present at a placement that can go in section I. So it's case dependent, but broadly, um, where the child attends, if if the child is not attending anywhere, then um, section I is left blank. There is a there is inherent in that in it. Uh, a broader question about what is a school or placement, what can be named in section I. Now I'll just point you to the to the cases on this. So a school is set out in section four of the Education Act. So it's an educational institution outside of the further or higher education um, sectors. Um, that is a question of fact for the local authority and or the tribunal. So it will look at management structures and um, funding and various other points. And that was a case called TB, where a unit at a school was considered to be in itself a school for the purposes of the law and could be named in Section I because it had a distinct management structure. It was getting separate funding and various other points. So it's a factual um, uh, consideration. Then a uh, post-16 institution is an institution which provides educational training for those over compulsory school age. So it's not limited to an FE college, for example. So sometimes you might get tutor colleges and have had these in cases occasionally where that would probably qualify as a post-16 institution, which means that it can be named in Section I. It doesn't need to be specified as EOTAS. So if that's what is being done, then, then that can go into section I. So that's the canter through section 61 and related issues. I'll hand back to James now, who's going to look at some of the more practical points of, and procedural points. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. So, yeah, hopefully that's been a, kind of a helpful summary of the case law. What I'm going to look at now is kind of how all that works in practice, if EOTAS is being considered. So if EOTAS might be needed, so that might be if a parent thinks it's needed or if a school or local authority thinks it may be needed, then one of the first things to think about is, does the child or young person have an EHC plan already? So because sometimes it, they, they might not, um, because yeah, whether they do will depend on what then needs to happen. So if the child doesn't have an EHC plan already, then firstly, if they're of compulsory school age, so they're kind of up to the age of 16, then in the interim, it may be if they're unable to attend school that the local authority has to provide educational provision under section 19 of the Education Act that we talked about already. Um, but the local authority have quite a wide discretion in relation to that. If though it's thought that that may need to be a permanent arrangement and that EATAS is needed for 
yeah, on an ongoing basis, then the first thing to do would be to request an EHC needs assessment. That request is made to the local authority and can be made by a parent or school. The legal threshold um, for um, when these requests are made that the local authority has to consider is does the child have or may have special educational needs and may they need provision in accordance with an EHCP? And I would say if there is evidence that a child who has or might have special educational needs might need EOTAS provision, then that threshold for assessment is likely to be met. The local authority should then, if they complete an assessment, they should gather information um, from a variety of people during the course of that, including an educational psychologist, including the school, parents, health and social care, and any other person that parents reasonably request they seek advice from. So that could include, for example, if a child's got sensory needs, a parent may consider it reasonable to get advice from an occupational therapist to inform that assessment. That can all take 20 weeks from start to finish legally. So it isn't necessarily going to be a quick process. The local authority, if it, on the conclusion of the assessment, would then issue an EHCP if they felt that is needed. And if they agreed EATAS was required, that EHCP should contain that EATAS provision in Section F. And we'll come on to kind of what a good EHCP should look like. If the child has an EHC plan already, so maybe they have an EHC plan that names a school, all of the provision that's in there, is on the assumption that their education is provided at school, but then people start to think, actually, is this right? Do they need provision in a, in a, in a non-formal setting? Then there are a couple of ways that that can then be considered. And it's the local authority, again, that needs to make this decision. So one thing that can be done is that the school could um, arrange an annual review. So an annual review kind of, it has to be held annually, as the name suggests, but it can be held, um, it doesn't have to be, it can be more often than, than that. And if it if um, if there's a need for potential need for different provision, then the school can request, can seek an annual review, arrange that, invite the relevant people, and the local authority would then have to consider that. The other option is that the school or parent can request a formal reassessment of needs. And essentially what happens there is that the local authority would have to do a reassessment and gather all of the information that we just talked about above. So a new educational psychology report, et cetera. So that's an option. I, would, I find that in practice, that is a little bit rare. It is, it's more rare than an annual review because it can take um, a bit more time. Sometimes it can take kind of up to 14 weeks. Whereas an annual review, you can get kind of a meeting in the diary quite quickly. Um, so usually the annual review is the way that that's considered. But sometimes a reassessment might be useful if, for example, the information in the EAC plan is out of date and the, and the child hasn't been assessed by an educational psychologist for a long time. So in terms of what evidence will be needed if a local authority is being asked to consider an EATAS package or the local authority themselves are considering an EATAS package. Um, again, I would say information from the school is going to be very important. Um, educational psychology advice. So has there been a recent educational psychology report? If not, then um, I would say an educational psychologist should be invited to the annual review or potentially reassessment could be considered. Are the therapists that work with the child, speech therapists, occupational therapists, do they have an opinion? Is a CAMS involved or any other relevant kind of medical professionals? So kind of evidence from all of these people is important as is evidence from the young person, child and parents themselves. And the two, I guess, key questions that that evidence would need to consider in my view are kind of, what are the needs, if there are needs, that mean it is inappropriate for the provision to be delivered at school or college? So, for example, is that the child has mental health needs or anxiety that means that they just cannot attend school? Or is there a need for kind of 
particular equipment that can't be provided at, at school or is the whatever it is kind of we, the, the reports would need to set that out to explain why that section 61 threshold that Leon talked about is met and then also the what you would want those reports to um, cover is what provision is actually required so what provision needs to be delivered on a near task basis and we want though and those recommendations should be specific and quantified because if EATAS is needed it's going to have to inform the plan and an EHC plan has to be specific and quantified so there's no room for doubt as to what is to be provided so if the reports that are being collected aren't right then the EHC plan is unlikely to be right either um, it's also worth putting together if um, for example, a parent considers that EATAS is needed. I think it's always helpful to put together a timetable or a provision plan, whatever you call it, in as much detail as possible to set out what is proposed. So that would be what the week will look like. So ideally, what would happen on Monday, what would happen on Tuesday, who will be involved, who will do what, where and when. So is that teachers? Is it tutors, teaching assistants, whatever it is? ABA professionals, um, we want that set out in the report. How many hours will each person be involved for? So if, if, a, if someone is recommending a particular provision, we want them to be as specific as possible. Where is it proposed the provision will be delivered? Okay, EOTAS is needed, but is that going to be at home? Is it proposed the library? What are the type, what are the type of features that the environment will need? What programmes and qualifications will the child or young person be, be studying? What are the outcomes that they'll be working towards? If they're, Ideally, if you're proposing a near task package, we want details of who will, of what qualifications that person has, or who you're proposing it delivers that. Um, so CV would be helpful. Will any particular equipment be needed? Um, think about if um, therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, will they? Will that be needed? And will that need to be built into the package? If so, we want the therapist to set that out and to be as specific as possible. And it's always important, I think, if, if a package is being proposed to set out the costs of that and from the outset, really, to avoid any arguments or disputes later. Um, I've some often we're, we're instructed in cases where an EATAS package exists, but... Um, the funding provided kind of it the, isn't necessarily agreed and so there can be arguments there and also it's important to get the views of the child and young person as to what they think about receiving education outside of a formal setting so i imagine a lot of people most of the people watching this will be familiar with an ehc plan so um, for purposes of time i'll just be very quick in relation to this so sections B and F of an EHC plan set out the educational needs and provision. Section E sets out the proposed outcomes. Section C sets out healthcare needs and healthcare provision. Section D is social care needs. Section H, social care provision. And section I is the school placement. Now, once a plan is finalised, the local authority are legally obliged to put in place and arrange the provision that's in section F, so the educational provision and the CCG are the ones that are legally responsible for delivering any provision in section G. And a few people ask this question, EHC plans can continue up until the, the age of 25 if there is an educational need for one. So in theory, if EOTAS provision is needed, there that can continue up until the age of 25. So that, that is the sections of an EHC plan. So what should a good EHC plan look like if EOTAS provision is to be delivered? So section B, I think it's important that section B explains why it's inappropriate for education to be delivered outside of a formal setting. So what is it about the child's needs that mean that they can't receive certain or all of the educational provision that they require in school. So do they have mental health needs? Uh, do they have 
sensory needs, whatever it is, you want section B should kind of tell the reader why this why a school based package isn't going to work. Section F is then the key section that play that should set out and be very clear as to what is going to be provided. And it's been well established that section F should be detailed and specific. The provision should be quantified in terms of the type, in terms of the hours and frequency of support and the level of expertise. And it should contain provision for every need specified in section B. So if, for example, section B details that a child has sensory needs, then there should be some provision in section F as to how those sensory needs are to be met. So with an EATAS package, if that's going to be provided, be that a full-time package or be that a part-time package, the plan should clearly set out the EATAS provision that's be to be delivered. That should include detail about who will oversee the programme, who will deliver it, what, how many hours those people are going to be involved for each week or kind of each term if someone's, whatever it is, how however often a person is going to be involved, how often and how much time is needed for that. It should set out where the EATAS provision will be delivered and what the requirements are for that environment. So, and that needs to be very clear because otherwise, if it doesn't, if, if for example, a plan said, um, it, it, this provision is going to be delivered off site, but we didn't describe what type of setting is needed or what type of environment is needed, then it could be that further down the line, there's a dispute over kind of whether or not the local library is going to be a suitable forum for that. So it's really important to set that out. Do those delivering the package require any particular level of training and experience? So if a plan doesn't set out, for example, that a, that a teaching assistant requires certain expertise, it could be that I could be instructed to buy a lot by somebody to deliver the provision in the plan and I don't have kind of any training in relation to how to um, work with um, that particular child's needs. So it's important that if, if training is needed and expertise is needed, set that out. If with the task packages, one of the issues can often be that because that a child isn't in school anymore, they're not necessarily getting the same social opportunities to meet with other children. So that would need to be thought about. And if they are going to attend groups or, or whatever it is as part of that package, that would need to be set out. Therapeutic input can still be delivered if and should still be delivered if um, it's required as part of an EATAS package. So again, the plan should set out should set all of that out very uh, clearly, including how much direct time, how how often they're going to see the child. Do they need to deliver any particular level of training to the staff that are going to be delivering the package on a on a daily basis? Um, is there any other professional input that is needed? So psychologists, counsellors, specialist teachers, dyslexia teachers. Uh, is any particular level of equipment needed? So any particular equipment. So is a laptop needed? Is an iPad needed? Is sensory equipment needed? Is there an alternative communication device that is required? All of that, if it educates or trains the young person, should be set out in Section F. So you just the aim really is that if you whoever picks up Section F, it, that they should be able to read it and be very clear as to what that child's week is going to look like. Um, if this is a full-time EATAS package, then as Leon mentioned, Section I should just be left blank. Um, if a school is to be attended, that should be named. But if it's a full-time package, that should be left blank. Um, Section F is where you get the detail. So that's what a good plan should look like. So we talked about annual reviews. Um, a child with an EATAS package would still, that plan would still need to be reviewed. Um, the it mentioned school there, but if it's a full-time package, generally these are arranged by the, the local authority. Um, and the purpose of an annual review is to look at the EHC plan. Does it continue to be um, accurate? Does anything need to be changed, updated? From year nine onwards, there must be a focus on preparing for adulthood, including um, employment and independent living. Um, and that needs to be thought about there. So there needs to be thought about is the provision 
is there a need for extra provision to help the child and young person develop those skills? With an annual review, the meeting is held, but the meeting isn't the end of the process. The meeting is part of it. What then happens following the meeting is that a report will be written if the child attends school for a period, the, the school would do that. If it's a full time package, the local authority would do that. Um, write up a report as to what was talked about at the meeting. And then the local authority need to make a decision following the meeting as to whether they're going to make any changes to the plan. So this is a really good opportunity if an EATAS package exists to look at, does it need to be tweaked? Should it continue? Um, this is how it would generally be considered. And the local authority within four weeks of the meeting have to decide and notify the parent whether or not they're going to make any changes to the plan. And then if they are to make changes to the plan, that should then be a new plan should be issued within eight weeks. So that's annual reviews and we'll move on to personal budgets and direct payments. So generally within the task package, Section F will set out the provision that is to be provided as part of that, and the local authority just have to arrange and fund that themselves. Now, there is scope if there is provision in the plan for a parent to request a personal budget and that that is added to the plan. Now, a personal budget is basically how much, an amount of money that's identified by the local authority to deliver the provision in a plan. Once there's a personal budget in a plan, a parent can ask for, for what's called a direct payment. And that's essentially where the local authority pays the money to the parent and they can then arrange that provision. So this can apply potentially to all of an EATAS package, or it could apply to elements of an EATAS package. So, for example, the therapy and um, parents arrange the speech therapy, but the local authority arranges the rest. Um, so... The time to do that generally is when a local authority is preparing a plan. So during the kind of assessment annual review or when they issue a draft plan. And if a request for a direct payment is, has been made, the local authority have to consider that. Now, they don't have to agree in every case. There are um, reasons that a local authority can give um, if they to, to um not provide a direct payment if they don't think that's appropriate. Um, so in order to agree to a direct payment, they need to be satisfied that the person receiving it will use it to secure the provision in the plan, that they'll act in the best interests of the child, that the direct payment will not have an adverse impact on other services. And this is one, probably the one that crops up the most, that um, securing the provision by way of a direct payment is an efficient use of the authority's resources. So usually you would find if a direct payment is requested and is refused, that is often because maybe the local authority considers that it can source that provision themselves at a reduced cost to how to the how um, to the cost to the parents if they were seeking it by way of a direct payment. Sometimes local authorities will have an agreement with the local health body, for example, whereby they've already paid for that health body to deliver therapy provision. And therefore, a local authority might say, we'll be paying twice for that if we give you a direct payment. So it's not an absolute right, but the local authority would have to consider it and give reasons. So this can be really useful with EATAS packages sometimes because it can provide parents with choice and flexible choice as to who they use to, to deliver the package and flexibility in terms of when that package is and provision is, is made, albeit the, the provision in the plan would still have to be delivered, but it gives a bit of flexibility maybe as, as to what time of day it's being uh, delivered. The disadvantage is, is that if a direct payment is made, then to the parent, they you become the parent will become the employer. That, that means there's be responsibilities in terms of tax and insurance, albeit there are organisations that local authorities should kind of have relationships with that can help parents with that but it's just something to consider. So often when Leon and I are instructed, it's because there's a disagreement as to whether or not EATAS provision is needed, or maybe EATAS provision is needed, but it's not being delivered, or there's a dispute about what that will look like. So how, how are those resolved? Um, and the main method I would say is through tribunal, because um, 
generally speaking, the EATAS provision would need to be set out in an EHC plan and the tribunal of the, of the forum which here um, disputes about what an EHC plan says. So that is kind of a, yeah, the, the main route really. Now before tribunal, there is also the option to mediate. All local authorities have contracts with independent mediation providers. So parents can choose to mediate if they want. The tribunal at the moment is taking kind of up to 12 months. So sometimes maybe mediation now can, is more important because it provides an opportunity to, to sort things out quickly. And sometimes we'll look at um, the types of situations where this might apply. Judicial review might be an option as well. So tribunal appeals, you can only appeal to the tribunal if there's an active right of appeal to the tribunal. And appeal rights will um, be granted when local authorities make certain decisions. So those decisions are if a local authority refuses to carry out an EHC assessment or they refuse to issue a plan, if, there's a, if they issue a plan and there's a disagreement as to the content, if they hold an annual review, and decide not to amend the plan or they amend it and parents disagree with the content or if a local authority decides to end a plan and that is disputed so in each of those decisions parent will or the young person if they're 16 or over will get a right of appeal there's a two-month deadline from the date of the decision letter parents can also now ask the tribunal to also make recommendations about the health and social care sections um, I also mentioned that tribunal appeals are taking, the tribunal are busier than ever at the moment. Um, what used to be a three, four month long process can now be a 12 month long process. So, so just raising that really. Um, I should say as well, an appeal, once an appeal is registered, there's still an expectation that people will work together to try and resolve things sooner rather than before the hearing. So um, yeah, it doesn't mean that once an appeal is registered, things will only be sorted through a hearing hopefully it will be the start of a discussion that may lead to an agreement being reached and a hearing not being needed um parents need to consider mediation they don't need to mediate but they need to show they've thought about it they do that by contacting the mediator um, the details should be in the decision letter that the local authority send out Mediation is essentially a meeting with an independent person that's there to kind of facilitate the discussion and, and see if that can help narrow the issues. So parents can mediate um, if they want. Once If the mediation resolves everything, great. If not, they'll be given a certificate and then we'll have another month to register their appeal. Um, judicial review could be an option when... An, Involving EATAS, if, for example, maybe the, uh, there is already an EHC plan that contains EATAS provision, but if that's not being delivered, then you, the tribunal don't need to be involved necessarily because the, it's already in the plan. So judicial review would be the option there. If a child's out of school and they're not receiving any education, then judicial review could be um, relevant there. If maybe an EATAS package has been requested through an annual review or an assessment and the local authority haven't complied with the legal time scales, then judicial review may, um, could be brought there. Or if a personal budget direct payment is requested and that's refused, then again, judicial review may be relevant as well. I would say if anybody is considers judicial review might be um, apply to them. It's always worth seeking advice from um, a specialist in the area. Um, so just flagging now that legal aid is still available for SEN appeals and judicial reviews. For tribunal appeals, whether someone's eligible, it depends on the parental means, so the, the parental income. Um, if a child is over 16, then it would be based on their means usually. For judicial review, it's generally based on the child's means as opposed to the parents. And there's a link there for the civil legal advice service that people can call if they want to check if they are eligible. In terms of where to go for help, 
Um, there's Send Support Kids, who uh, involved, obviously were involved in this webinar. Leon mentioned at the beginning, the website, there's a link for it there, basically provides a forum in which parents can, or, or anybody involved in the Send community, can register and ask questions and they'll then get a reply from legal professionals. And the Noddy Guide is also, as Leon mentioned, being um, built in to that forum as well. So that's a really, if, if you've got any questions following this webinar, do go on to the website, do register and put the questions there. There's also the Noddy Guide in a PDF format, and there's a link to that as well. So I'll now hand over to questions. I think we've had quite a few. Yes, so um, we we said we're down for an hour, but we'll, 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 we've got a bit of time. I think it was initially just for a bit longer, so we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time going through some questions. Um, I'll warn you that we've had um, over 130, so <laughs> we're not <laughs> going to get through them, but we you've been directed to the Support Send Kids website, obviously. What I'll try and do is try and to put them into themes perhaps and then we'll try and answer several at once so that will cover off some some of them James and I've done written answers to and that's they should have appeared I think about 20 or so which should have appeared on your your site so just to give you a break James I'll pick up one theme and maybe I'll pass one over to you if yeah um, if that's okay so um so one of the themes that I've had is what basically what goes into section f with broader concerns about um provision that would usually be delivered in a school. Um, so I think it's important to make sure we're clear on where EOTAS fits into the SEN system. So an EHCP will um, look to identify special educational needs and special educational provision. Now, those are both defined within the legislation as needs that call for provision and provision that is broadly not provided by mainstream. So the only thing that goes into section F is that provision which a child needs which isn't generally provided by mainstream so a small class size might be but uh you know, putting in a, a an average class size wouldn't be because that's what's provided in mainstream and then eotas then fits in after that which to say which of that provision in section f um has to be delivered or would be inappropriately delivered in a school or college so it's at that stage in terms of the delivery of provision that EOTAS comes in. It doesn't fall into sections B and F. And why that may make a difference is the SEN regime is um, to cover uh, the provision that's not made in mainstream, which means that in the plan, you won't generally start finding things like need to do PE class unless it's related to maybe an OT need or needs to do sort of general things in a school because that's provided by mainstream. So the answer to those questions, about two or three of them, is you wouldn't normally put stuff that happens in mainstream unless it's related to the SEN. Um, and there might be wider duties on the local authority to deliver that kind of provision in their wider du educational duties, but in terms of the HCP, you wouldn't put it in Section F. Related to that, there's another two or three questions that I've seen about um, parents delivering provision, and parents seem to be concerned that they're being asked by the local authority to design a curriculum, which obviously, well, obviously many parents are very... <laughs> Uh, some parents may be able to do, but most parents would find that difficult because they're not educationists. So um, how does that fit in? Well, that's not acceptable um, if that's what's happening. The Section F needs to specify, it needs to be specific as to um, what provision is required. And that may mean a qualified teacher designing the curriculum in the home setting. And so that would need to go into Section F. It shouldn't be on parents. In fact, not only it shouldn't, lawfully it cannot be on parents to uh, provide special educational provision. There's a range of cases on that, but parents can't be required to deliver provision. And so therefore um, they can't be expected to design curriculums for um, students. So those cover about six. Another theme that came up, and this is the one James I was thinking maybe handing to you, is on um, evidence. So parents saying, I, what evidence um, can we show that it's inappropriate for um, provision to be delivered in a school or college? Do you have any views on that? Or Yeah. Um, so in terms of evidence, the often parents might need to be proactive because 
if the local authority aren't in agreement, then kind of they've already taken that view. So um, I guess evidence, sometimes if the child just isn't attending, so despite best efforts, their needs are such that they're just they've not attended for um, a, a period of time, then that in of, of, in of itself would be relevant evidence. If there's medical professionals that can comment on that, so maybe CAMS, a GP, um, if the school are of that, then that would be helpful. The school may also have views. So if the school, for example, is saying that we don't think we're an appropriate setting, we think this child needs to be educated at home or wherever it is, that would be relevant. Um, parents, I think I mentioned in my slides, there's always scope. It's not something that I think that I see very much in practice, but there's always scope to request the reassessment. So that's a formal reassessment that the local authority would do, and they'd have to then bring their educational psychologist to do a new report, and that could be relevant evidence and kind of you there's other kind of therapists could in, could feed into that reassessment. These people could also be invited to the annual review, get everyone around the table, and that could provide relevant evidence as well. So yeah, I think there's um a lot of yeah it's all all anyone who knows the child that evidence is going to be relevant essentially i've seen a lot of questions as well leon about um kind of why should the burden be on the parents to put together a proposed plan and again i, I think the the issue there is often that might be because the local authority have a different view so the local authority's view is eotas isn't needed and therefore we're not going to put together a proposed plan um, and that, and I think for that reason, that's why then the onus is on the parents put together what that proposal is so that the local authority can, cons can consider it, because if they aren't necessarily persuaded it's needed, they're not going to, to do that. Uh, and the tribunal also would, yeah, it, the onus would be on the parents to, to, present, to prepare their case for the tribunal and the tribunal would want that information. Yeah, I agree. And then um, taking on from that, there's another thing, maybe about five questions I've seen about um, not being heard by the local authority and parents, I think, are saying, well, we uh, we haven't either haven't been consulted or when we've been consulted, we haven't been heard and, and fundamentally disagree in the, the local authority naming a uh, school. And I think that one of the examples was a mainstream school. So um, what can we do? I think, well, if you are of the view as a parent this is mainly advice to parents but obviously um, has implications for local authorities but if as a parent you want eo test or think that the test is met i.e it'd be inappropriate to deliver the provision in a school or college then make that known to the local authority and give your reasons for why you say that and um fundamentally i know it takes steps as james has gone through eventually effectively going to tribunal etc but effectively the local authority will have to prove that their school is suitable and it would be appropriate to deliver the provision in that school so um, it's effectively the burden is really on the local authority to show that whatever they're proposing is suitable so um so make sure you try and get involved in the conversation early and make sure you make your point to the local authority initially but then moving on from that you can then always challenge the local authority on their decision making in tribunal but as I say I know that takes time and and um, is often more easily done when you have legal advice. Another question Leon is a theme is and I think it's a good one is does deregistering your child reduce the chances of getting EOTAS? Um, I think on that one it depends I would say um, so I guess this is where maybe a placement's we talked about someone's making that decision to electively home educate because they, it's felt that the provision that's in place isn't suitable. Um, in my in my view, it, yeah, it can. It's not impossible in that situation to still. It, it can have an impact sometimes because we talked about the threshold is to show that school based provision is inappropriate, and if a child isn't attending school, then it might be harder to show that. Experts that maybe need to um, consider this question 
might not if they're not if they're unable to see the child in school they may be um it might impact their ability to comment on that um and also because of that that high threshold you could have lots of evidence that maybe the work that is being done at home is really good but what you need to show is the question is is that inappropriate so um it's not impossible i um i've been involved in cases where that has been the case and eatas packages have been secured but it needs some thought i think about yeah about kind of will that make it harder to collect the the relevant evidence anything to add leon on that one no that's no i i agree with all of that i mean a lot of things are contact you know, fact specific and um depending on what what the reasons are um one says that the test is fulfilled or not so um but i another thing that was i've seen a few were picked up at things i was saying about the part time well, effectively i was part-time eo test so where you've got a placement where a child might be attending for some days a week um, and then there's particular provision that needs to be delivered elsewhere. So the examples I've had recently in cases are things like I mentioned physiotherapy or some kind of therapy that needs to specifically be delivered somewhere where that would be provided by EOTAS. But that's just simply the child attends a placement, is on the roll at a placement, and then for certain bits of the provision, then the uh, the child would maybe on a Friday morning go elsewhere for physio. So I wasn't thinking some of the question about dual registration. I wasn't really going down that line. I was just saying that it's it's lawful for some to be made in the placement and some not to be made in the placement. And probably that's the most common form of EO test I would have thought, rather than a wholesale pack, EO test package outside of outside of a placement. And that's quite normal. And as I say it's on you know, in terms of the structure of where this fits into the EHC plan law. The I said so section F is basically the provision that's outside of mainstream, but then there's a duty on the local authority to deliver all of that. And what section 61 essentially does is give the local authority a discretion in particular circumstances to deliver some of that not in a college or um or a school. And so that's how it sort of fits in. So it's perfectly normal and lawful for some provision to be made outside of school. Have you got any other themes, James? Yeah, I was just picking up on, there seems to be a few questions about personal budgets um, yeah, sure. and kind of, yeah, just just around those. And I think maybe the key point is that in order to request a personal budget, the plan needs to set out the provision that you're seeking, essentially. So requesting a personal budget wouldn't necessarily be a solution if an EHC plan doesn't um if there's a dispute about whether the child needs the task provision or not. Um, but if, because, because firstly, the plan needs to, a personal budget can only be requested for provision that is already set out in the plan. So where a personal budget and direct payment might be relevant is if it's agreed that there the needs to be an EATAS package or if it's ordered by the tribunal and it's felt that a personal budget and direct payment would work well, in this case, then that would be the time to then request it. So for this element of the, the plan in section F, I would like a personal budget for this, please. So it's, yeah, it, it's not necessarily a way to, the first thing that needs to be sorted is the wording of the plan. And then you can request the personal budget as a parent. I think that hopefully answers some of the questions on yeah. that point. Okay, well, should we do? I've got one more here, which is just sort of caught my eye, which was, which I don't think we've we've really covered, which is about, which I think um, it raises the question about the context in which the question or the discussion is being asked about whether it's inappropriate or not, and whether whether EO test is necessary. So, um, which is that what if, and the question is what if the local authority can't find a local placement and everywhere's being consulted saying and saying no, we can't meet need. Now, I think the the very strict legal test of EOTS does work to an extent in the context in which you're looking at it. So if the local authority cannot deliver a school or cannot provide a school, that would seem to be quite a good indication that EOTAS should be on the table. Um, and actually, if there's no other, you know, if you get to tribunal and there's only one placement or one proposal on the table, then that's pretty much what gets ordered. So um, 
I think those things are related. So if the local authority can't locally find a school, I think you'll and, and you want EOTAS, that's a pretty good reason to say it would be inappropriate to be delivered in a school. Um, and I've also heard just one below, one above that. There was a uh, someone saying the local authority policy was that they don't deliver EOTAS or don't take requests for EOTAS. I think that's um well, query the lawfulness of that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is not whether well, that's all the policies. <laughs> But if the local authority cannot find a suitable school to deliver provision, then obviously you tested is and should be on the table. Yeah. And the yeah. test that the, the only test really the local authority should any local authority should be applying is the what's in the case the the legislation that Leon talked you through and the and the case law. Um just one final question, Leon. I just thought that might yeah, be helpful because it gets into the, the question of specificity. So um Someone mentions that if therapy is in a plan, who is responsible for getting them there? Um, and so if there's an issue about kind of, the, does the transport need to be set out in the in, in the HC plan? And generally it wouldn't, you wouldn't see transport in there unless the transport itself educates or trains, but ultimately the local authority are responsible for arranging any of the provision that's in the plan so that could mean if the only way of them getting a child accessing that therapy is by traveling there then that may well mean that the local authority have to make such arrangements to enable that to happen um i think this goes back to the point as well about when a when a package is being put together and a proposal is put to the local authority, it's things like this that are why it's really important to put together the costs so that there's agreement ideally from the outset as to what is going to be, how much is going to be funded. Uh, because yeah, it, it, you, you, you do see these types of issues come up quite a lot. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I think, I think we've actually done, Okay, in terms of answering questions, there are there obviously will be some we've not directly answered, which um, we apologise for. And um, as we've directed to the Support Send Kids website, where it's a good place um, to be uh, asking those, and hopefully there'll be and and there are new lawyers on that site who um, who volunteer their time to answer some of the questions, including James and myself. So um, there are other and and other others as well. So um, have a look there. Um, and just say thank you very much for joining us today. Um, you've been sort of taken aback at the interest in this seminar, which shows how widely EOTAS is being thought about. So, um, so thank you very much for joining and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.